American Experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At Liberty Mutual Insurance, we do everything we can to help prevent accidents and make America a safer place. Liberty Mutual is proud to support American Experience. How do you get a weed-free lawn? A healthy garden, a home that's pest free. Every day we work to find new and better solutions. Ortho, proud to support the American Experience on PBS. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Of the hill, pull up behind two six maybe. Come on, Sergeant Havard, you're overdue. Take a deep breath. Come on. If y'all move out up there to get up on the top, go ahead. Let the second platoon handle it if they can. The soldiers got a great deal of support from the states. Uh, classes by the hundreds would write letters addressed to a soldier in Vietnam and and these were packed up and sent to our unit and uh, by and large the the soldiers would try to respond to these things there was a a groundswell of, of popular support behind the troops in 1965 American combat troops went to South Vietnam to prevent the communists from taking over. Before that, Americans had served as advisors to the South Vietnamese army. The advisory effort had failed. Now America was taking charge of the war. South Vietnam was on the other side of America's world. It was a strange, incomprehensible country for the American soldiers. A land whose people, language, and culture were completely unfamiliar. Over the next two years, the American force built up to nearly half a million troops. They were deployed in mountains, plains, and deltas. They fought highly trained North Vietnamese regulars and lightly armed South Vietnamese guerrillas. This is the story of a few of those men. I had been accepted in at uh, several colleges, four colleges by my senior year. And then I just decided, no, I'm going to I'm going to join the Marines. And I had to spend a lot of time talking to my parents about it because at 17, of course, I would not have been allowed to sign an enlistment contract in my own right. They had to sign it too. And really, what I think what tipped the scales in the discussion was at one point after talking for a long time, I said, uh, Mom, is this the way you raised me to let other mother's sons fight America's wars? And they were young people during World War II. They believed in their country. Uh, and that was it. They hadn't raised me that way. Before going to Vietnam, recruits were shown an official film produced to explain America's commitment. I do not find it easy to send the flower of our youth, our finest young men, into battle. I have seen them in a thousand streets of a hundred towns in every state in this union, working and laughing and building and filled with hope and life. But as long as there are men who hate and destroy, we must have the courage to resist. During my senior year, um, when 
when the government said that the communists were taking over Vietnam and, and if we didn't stop them there, we would have to stop them eventually in San Diego. Uh, I took that at face value and I saw my opportunity to really, uh, to be a hero. The people of South Vietnam have fought for many long years. Thousands of them have died. Thousands more have been crippled and scarred by war. And we just cannot now dishonor our word or abandon our commitment or leave those who believed us and who trusted us to the terror and repression and murder that would follow. This then, my fellow Americans, is why we're in Vietnam. The buildup of American forces accelerated during 1965. Trained to fight a conventional war against the Soviets in Europe, the Americans found themselves unwrapping hand grenades in South Vietnam. By the end of the year, nearly 200,000 American troops had landed. One of the things that struck me first upon arriving in Vietnam and, and still strikes me now was that it was probably the most beautiful country I've ever seen. Uh, and the one aspect of it that strikes me most deeply and that stays with me and is the hardest to describe is the intensity of the colors, uh, especially the greens. They virtually, I mean, they almost vibrated. They were that intense. American soldiers were unprepared for the complexity of South Vietnam. Some Vietnamese were loyal to communist North Vietnam and the Viet Cong guerrillas. Some belonged to various religious and political factions. Many tried to remain neutral. Others supported the anti-communist government backed by the United States. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese Army, the NVA, controlled large parts of South Vietnam. GIs call these areas Indian country. The villages were hidden because they were almost always surrounded by very thick hedges. From outside the village, you might not even see any evidence of a village. And then you'd walk through this hedge and here was this whole society. We knew that the people who lived there probably lived normal lives that we might even understand if we were a part of it. But we weren't a part of it. All we saw were the people staring at us like we were from Mars. One of the first things that I began to wonder about, uh, really wonder about is the uh, the soldiers who were our allies, the, the Army of the Republic, uh, we call them Arvin, they wouldn't fight, at least in our area, uh, in a heavily populated civilian area where the enemy was, was literally the old farmer by day, fighter by night kind of thing, with virtually no equipment except what they could capture from the Americans and the Arvin. Uh, tremendously outnumbered, the Viet Cong were there day after day after day picking away at us, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like gophers at the feet of a buffalo or something. Um, and it occurred to me, these are the same people. The Arvin and the VC are the same people, the same race, uh, the same culture, and yet one side seems to be chicken and the other side seems to fight in the face of overwhelming disadvantages. And I started wondering why, you know, why is this? They were far more mobile than we were. It was their country. They knew where they were going. They didn't need guides to get them around. They didn't need interpreters. When we went to the field, we took 50, 50 60, 70 pounds of gear. Your average Viet Cong guerrilla might have carried, might have been carrying 10 pounds worth of stuff. He'd carry a rifle and a few rounds of ammunition and a little plastic bag or a leaf filled with some rice. 
That's all that man needed. Or woman, there were a lot of female gorillas. So they were quick, they could get around, and if they did not want to engage you, they simply melted away, they disappeared, you didn't see them. Whenever you did make contact with the enemy, you'd go from the most horrible boredom, I mean, just absolute deathly boredom, to absolutely the other extreme, the most intense, continual excitement I've ever known in my life. Uh, I, I'm not sure how to describe the energy you would feel and the excitement you would feel, however you felt about it in terms of being scared or liking it or disliking it or whatever. The excitement was there, I think, for everybody. You couldn't go through combat and remain detached. It was uh, the idea of someone shooting at you. Someone was trying to kill you. You were trying to kill someone. Uh, you were using that finger to try to take someone's life, and that sends a real charge through you. break the will of the enemy and make them talk peace on America's terms. It brought to bear the power of its industry and technology and also its young men. one time when the 22nd NVA regiment was located down on the coast in an open area. Um, they were trying to move from one point to another and had hoped to be able to carry out this movement without being detected. But the 1st and 9th Cav did detect them, detected them very late in the evening. It was around 5.30 or 6 o'clock. And throughout the next two days, it proceeded to eliminate them once again, I might point out, primarily through the use of awesome firepower. But I know my battalion alone fired 22,000 artillery rounds into a very small area. And this area had been heavy jungle uh, when we started the fight. And it really looked like the moonscape when we got through. But it wasn't just artillery fire. You had had airstrikes coming in. Uh, tanks were brought up. And this was the third time that we had run up against the 22nd NVA regiment. And every time we ran up against them, why we would tear them up and they would fall back into the mountains and six months later they'd come back completely refurbished uh, a new regiment and we'd have to go through this drill again we captured the operations officer the 22nd NBA regiment he was very interesting to talk to after we'd had him for about a month this man was a senior captain, which would be the equivalent, probably, of a major or lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. Uh, he was as dedicated uh, to his leaders as I was dedicated to mine. I wasn't questioning uh, what I was doing in Vietnam, either. Uh, my leaders decided that I should go, and I, and I went, and I was a good soldier. Uh, he was in the same position. Is that He was down there reunifying his country, as far as he was concerned. And uh, that was uh, all that he needed to know. Infiltration of large North Vietnamese army units into South Vietnam increased rapidly as American troops expanded their combat role. When the North Vietnamese reached the South, they often relied on Viet Cong guerrillas recruited from Vietnam's predominantly peasant society. In Vietnam, for generations, 
the real power and the economy and the education through which you get power uh, was in the hands of a very few people. Maybe three to five percent of the population controlled the government, controlled the economic life of the country. If you were a peasant or lowly born, it was almost impossible to break out of this chain of your father and your grandfather. The Viet Cong quite often can turn the peasant's mind into the idea that if you revolt, if you join us, we can change this system. As a result, many young men and women voluntarily, willingly join the Viet Cong in Vietnam. He's developed into a, a savior of his village and his family, a super nationalist. He has to be able to be a pretty savage fighter, ambushes, quick hit and run uh, operations, participate in the terrorism and, and beheading or assassinations of village chiefs or effective government officials who are opposed to him. He might be an extremely sensitive young man, may be Buddhist, may regard human life very highly, actually lose merits for his passage to the life beyond by taking human life. It's a complete metamorphosis when he was riding that buffalo in the paddy field and became a fighting soldier against the government. Most of our enemy contact at that time was not contact at all. It was mines and snipers, mostly mines. Our battalion, if I recall correctly, had something on the order of 75 mining incidents per month. Uh, most of them, many of them producing casualties. So you, day after day, you had uh, dead Marines, wounded Marines, and nobody to fight back at. In the meantime, you've got guys, you know, you go out, you run a patrol, somebody hits a mine, there's a couple of dead people, and here's, here's Joe the rice farmer out in his field, it's just, he don't even stop, he don't even, it's like he didn't even hear the blast. And after a while, you, you start thinking, wait, these people must know where these mines are. How come they never step on them? Uh, they, they must be, uh, they must be VC, they must be VC sympathizers. And so over a relatively short period of time, you begin to treat all of the Vietnamese as though they are the enemy. If you can't tell, you, you uh, shoot first and ask questions later. To deprive the enemy of peasant support, the American command tried a new tactic, moving the population out of Viet Cong base areas. Uh, actually, if the operation itself consisted of a mobile landing, air mobile landing by helicopter, in seven separate landing zones. And this uh, simultaneous landing of this much force enabled us to get complete surprise. And as a result of the surprise achieved, the VC, many of whom were in the town, some uh, in the area just adjacent there too, were caught totally by surprise, many without weapons uh, running to the tunnels and hiding places which they had developed over the years. Because of this complete surprise, we uh, got either by killing or capturing, over 30 VC uh, in the initial wave. The main goal of it was to eliminate the, <clears throat> the National Liberation Front political and military structure from a triangular area about 50, 60 square miles. And it was decided that in order to do this, they would move out the entire population. The part I was involved in was the evacuation of Ben Sook, which was a decent-sized city of perhaps around 3,000 people. We were providing some medical screening and medical backup for the operation. The 
during the evacuation of the villagers uh, from Ben Sook, I was struck by a sense of resoluteness in the villagers. They understood what was happening. They understood that they couldn't really change the, uh, change the situation. They were going to be taken out of their homes. Now, I'm sure that deep down inside, they knew that uh, that was the end of Ben Sook as a village, that we were going to destroy the village. They seem to accept it with a very special kind of strength. It was kind of sad in a way because Ben Sook was a pretty village. It was a very old village. The people there seemed to enjoy a little better standard of living than people in any of the other villages. The villagers were taken out by boat, by helicopter, and by truck to relocation centers. Basically, once the people were taken out, the whole thing was just turned into a parking lot. At the same time, the villages themselves would be destroyed. Anything of material value would be eliminated. Mattresses would be slashed. Rice would either be taken out or poisoned or dumped in the river. Crops would be defoliated, and it made it much more difficult for the, uh, for the Liberation Front to continue without this material and population base. For about the press years, corps in Saigon was briefed on the operation called Cedar Falls, Falls by its commander, well, General Jonathan Seaman. They'll have a little trouble using them. Uh, but I, I should say right now that to destroy these uh, vast tunnel complexes is a pretty formidable job. And we do the best we can. And uh, I'm sure that if they're willing to go back in with uh, just a whale of a lot of effort and expend all that effort, they could probably rehabilitate them over a period of years but or months. But when you realize that it's taken them about 20 years to build this thing up, uh, I, if I were a VC, I'd be somewhat discouraged. American forces ended the operation and withdrew. Soon, even without help from the civilian population, the enemy was back in its base, again threatening the region around Saigon. What really began to happen after a, after a few months was that you begin, you could get as far as understanding that this was crazy. What was going on here was nuts but you didn't dare begin to draw conclusions from that because they pointed in directions that were just terrifying. I mean, America might not be the, the guys on the white horses with the white hats. Uh, maybe we shouldn't be in Vietnam. Maybe I've gotten my ass out here in the bushes for nothing. You can't think about that kind of stuff in a situation like that. For instance, it never occurred to me to quit. I lay down my rifle and say, I'm not going to do this. Somewhere lurking in the back of my mind was 20 years of making big rocks into little rocks. I knew when I went to Vietnam that I had to be there for 395 days. And if I was still alive when I got to the end of those 395 days, I could go home and forget the whole thing. If you wondered, you know, are we going to make contact today? Are we going to get hit? But if you spend a lot of time thinking about that, particularly, is this the day I'm going to buy the farm, you go nuts. You go nuts. You found ways, without even doing it consciously, of, of keeping your thoughts well within the immediate environment that you were dealing with. There were leeches everywhere, and so whenever you stopped for a break, you'd have to take your boots off and check for leeches. One of the major problems that guys had was a thing called immersion foot. Uh, you get this kind of rot on your feet because, because your feet were always wet. It did get cold at night when we were out uh, on operations during the monsoon.
the heat was a lot harder to deal with in, in the summer months. You had been used to 100, uh, regularly 100 degrees, up to 110. Some days it would get up to 120. And we ended up taking a lot of chances. You'd go without a flak jacket, you'd go without a helmet. You, know, you were trying to decide what the odds were of getting heat stroke as opposed to what the odds were of getting hit. I don't have nightmares about killing armed soldiers in combat. The thing I have the nightmares about is the woman in the rice field that I shot one day because she was running for no other reason, because she was running away from the Americans who were going to kill her, and I killed her. 55, 60 years old, unarmed, and at the time I didn't even think twice about it. It's, it's not like the San Francisco 49ers on one side of the field and the Cincinnati Bengals on the other. It's just not like that. It's, uh, uh, the enemy is all around you. Uh, uh, one second uh, you may be fired upon from the rear, uh, the next second from straight ahead or, or either flank. Uh, you never know. In other words, you never knew who was the enemy and who was the friend. They all dressed like they were all Vietnamese. Some of them were, were, were Viet Cong. They all looked alike. What follows is an account from both sides, American and Vietnamese, of what happened in a village Marines were trying to clear of Viet Cong, 10 miles from where US troops first landed in 1965. It's January, 1967. We planned a detailed two-company operation involving a golf company of, of the 2nd Battalion, 1st Marines, and hotel company, which I commanded. Uh, I was put in charge of the operation as a senior company commander. Well, I could say, like, normally you come through on the village, and the operation you come through on a sweeping motion online, and you're sweeping through the village. So we get up to this village, and uh, first you start off with a little light sniper fire, you know? Then, then you get this 50 calibers opened up, you're getting 30 calibers opened up, and, uh, you're getting people falling all over, so you're, you're, you're running around trying to find out what you're doing. So we spread out and dug in. The lead squad of, of that third platoon got about 100 to 150 meters from the tree line, and uh, fire increased from the tree line directly to their front, and they also started receiving fire from uh, both their flanks. It was intense gunfire, and it sounded like a jackhammer. If you ever hear a jackhammer going off, it sounded like you had about 10, 15 jackhammers going off at the same time. I mean, total chaos. And I called in artillery support uh, to fire on the tree line. Waiting for the word to, uh, to advance, but there was not no advance. We was pinned down, and we were pinned down all day, all night. In the rain, it rained like something pitiful. You couldn't see nothing. You couldn't see nothing. You were just pinned out there. And uh, we had casualties. We took on a lot of casualties. Out of about 30 men, there were, there were 11 left. And uh, we called in helicopters uh, to come in that night in the darkness to get the wounded and, and killed out. The first helicopter load we got out uh, was the last one because the uh, Viet Cong opened up on a helicopter wounding the pilot, and no other pilots were willing to volunteer to come in. I'd watch the guys lay there and cry for their mothers all night long. Dying. Slowly dying. Asking to be shot because you can't take it no more. And you're sitting up there with your, with your bundle of nerves. Your bundle of nerves. And all you can do is wait, 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 wait. We ended up going some 36 plus hours without food or water. Uh, or sleep, obviously, and uh, that is saying a lot when you consider that the temperature was around 100 degrees. Uh, no water, no food, no rest. Uh, we were pretty tired Marines at the end of that, uh, of that first day. Uh, there were two villages there that, that the battalion wanted, swept, and searched. Uh, 
uh, to, you know, to see if there were any remaining VC in there. It lightened, lightened up, and then uh, we advanced towards the village. When the Americans came, I was a boy in the fourth grade. I was on my way to school when I heard the Americans were coming. I was very scared and ran back home with my friends. By the time I got there and had hidden my things, the Americans were close to the village. Airplanes were overhead bombing. Soldiers were coming and shells were exploding. Somebody had seen some movement in some of the houses, and next thing we knew, we were receiving automatic weapons fire. Uh, Lieutenant O'Connor was hit in the left shoulder and above the heart, and uh, he's bleeding quite severely. Uh, I remember sloshing back to where he would, he went down with the company corpsman, and uh, uh, we uh, started returning fire and providing a, a covering base of fire, calling artillery in, and scheduled an emergency medevac uh, helicopter to come in and get Lieutenant O'Connor out. Uh, Lieutenant O'Connor, I recall, was delirious. Uh, uh, he, was, he kept trying to get up. It was, it was taking three of us to keep him on the ground. Uh, he, was, he kept trying to get up to get to his platoon to, to deploy them and, and, and command them, not realizing how seriously he was hurt. Uh, the corpsman put a hemostat on the artery to, 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 to stop the bleeding, and uh, <clears throat> we were successful in getting a helicopter to uh, take out Lieutenant O'Connor at the same time as we assaulted the village two or three hundred meters uh, to the front of us where the fire was coming from. We was the first team in. We, we, un we unloaded a several rounds. We dropped a couple of grenades in the, in the hooches to get the people up because to get one v Vietnamese out of that hole, they won't come. I mean, you and we didn't speak perfect Vietnamese, so uh, in order to get them out of there, you either cranked off a couple of rounds or you drop your M26 grenade down there. And they get the message and they come on out of there. The assault took uh, anywhere from two to three minutes, maybe five minutes at the outside. As quickly as I could determine that there were, or there was no longer any fire being returned, I ordered ceasefire and consolidation. <laughs> When they came to my house, there were 10 family members inside, including my 14-year-old son. Four or five soldiers came right over. When they came in, I stood up and greeted them. They laughed when I did that. They seemed to hate us. They just turned around and threw a grenade into the house. Nine or ten people were blown to pieces. I was the only one who was wounded and survived. My son and everyone else just fell dead. I was wounded and extremely frightened and crawled quickly into a corner of the house. Although the grenade had already exploded, the soldiers fired their guns at the people to make sure that nobody would survive. It was mass chaos, like I say. Everybody's running around screaming. We got in the village and they're asking where the VC were, and people in the village were saying no VC. And like at one end of the village, you could hear uh, machine gun fire going off and people screaming, you know, and you know that somebody was either down in one of them holes getting dug out of there or something. And uh, you, we dropped plenty of hand grenades down in, in booby traps, I mean, in, in holes and stuff to, uh, to see if we could root them out. You, know, you go into a hooch and you got. Uh, you got tunnels in there, and uh, you got old ladies and kids in there running out. And uh, we didn't, uh, I didn't shoot any old ladies and kids. I don't, I know half the guys in my squad didn't shoot no old ladies and kids because it's it just, that wasn't the fight there. They came and asked us about the Viet Cong. There were only women and children around then, and we didn't know where the VC were. But they shot at us anyway. They burned down the houses, and then they killed all our farm animals. After they killed the people, they burned down all the houses, 
So the survivors had no place to live. They burned everything. Even dead children were burned. So I could collect only this much of the remains of three children. It was only a handful of bones. Like I say, you're getting away with uh, M14 or M60 caliber machine gun. There's no telling who's going to get killed. And you got an angry 18-year-old kid behind the gun, and he just seen his buddy get killed. He's not going to have no remorse of who's on the receiving end of that 60 caliber machine gun. The soldiers used their guns in a very brutal way. Some of the wounded people went to their beds to lie down. The soldiers shot their ears. Blood was coming out in pools as they lay there. Then the soldiers shot at their stomachs and their insides splattered all over. Then they smashed people's heads using the butts of their guns. This terrified everybody who was still alive. The children screamed at the brutality they were seeing. But the soldiers kept on with their questioning. First they shot our water basin to pieces. Then they just opened fire at us, just opened fire continuously. I was wounded and fell down. Looking back at that time, I have to say that it was so horrible that I can't describe it all. After I was wounded, I was wounded here and there's still a scar from the bullet wound right here. Several dead people fell on me. So, I escaped being killed. Probably in his eyes from a kid's point of view, probably did. he probably seen it that way. But uh, like I said, we done a dog down job that third day, and uh, there wasn't nothing unusual about burning them hooches down and digging them uh, Vietnamese people out of that out of them holes and uh, scattering a animals, pigs and chickens around like we normally do. That's just a normal procedure we do, especially after three days, three days of blood and guts and and, and the mud. Hey, you can't take it. We couldn't take it, and uh, like that said, I can't account for every Marine that was there or what they done that. Uh, at that particular time, they done it because uh, they felt that uh, that's what they had to do. I can't account for how they acted, you know. Everybody's got their own way, but if you seen it that way, uh, it's the way you see it. The way I seen it was uh, was uh, it was war. After military operations in the field men return to their base camps. They were little American islands in the midst of South Vietnam. Next to the bases, small Vietnamese towns grew up. For the men here and on the new American air bases, there was never much time off from the war. Bombing operations were conducted around the clock. North Vietnam was a main target. The bombing of North Vietnam was considered a linchpin of the whole war strategy for two reasons. Uh, first, it was the way you applied pressure and caused pain in North Vietnam itself. Secondly, it was <clears throat> supposedly the way you cut off the necessary flow of supplies from North Vietnam to the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops fighting in South Vietnam. Interdiction was the key term. And it looked to us that even though we were stepping up the bombing almost month by month, that there was no impact on 
North Vietnamese and Viet Cong military activities in the South. So we had to ask the question, was the interdiction campaign working at all? So we started to make the calculations. How much uh, supplies would have to come from North to South to keep uh, 150,000 troops uh, in the field and fighting, producing as much devastation as they were. And we had a pretty good fix on how many trucks the North Vietnamese were sending down. And we estimated, uh, as I remember it, something like 50 to 100 trucks a week, and that they only needed to get through 10 or 20 of those trucks to maintain just that level of military activity that they had been carrying out. And we estimated that based on past experience, there was no way we could eliminate those, uh, that 20%. No matter how bombing the effective was, they were going to get at least that through. In other words, the inter interdiction campaign was not working and would not work. Now, of course, there was one alternative. You could have engaged in the kind of bombing of North Vietnam that would have devastated the society totally. You could have bombed the dams. You could have destroyed the population. I suppose you could have used nuclear weapons. We, I think, fortunately, had the good judgment, had the, the basic humanity, not to consider that kind of a bombing campaign. By the end of 1967, the war was draining America's armed forces. When experienced soldiers completed their one-year tour of duty, their replacements included a growing proportion of draftees. When I first spotted Vietnam, when I first spotted the country from the plane is when I really started to understand that there's really a war going on here, you know? I mean, I could tell by looking at the countryside there were bomb craters, artillery craters, everywhere. I mean, it wasn't as if you saw a nice, beautiful forest and, and then you went on in and you saw a battleground then. The whole country was covered with bomb craters. As soon as the plane landed and we got off the plane, we got onto these buses. Um, typical bus, except for the, they look like prison buses, army green prison buses with wire mesh over the windows. And I asked, why, you know, the, this kind of, wh why, you know, this kind of bus? I thought we were in friendly country here, you know, and they told me that it was to stop people from running up and throwing grenades into the bus. <laughs> I went, oh my God, you mean people are gonna try to kill me? <laughs> Wait a minute, you know, I never really thought about dying before. I was drafted, uh, pretty naive, uh, you know, 20 year old kid, really, hardly a man, and uh, with a pretty uh, narrow view of what the world was really like. As soon as I got there, things just, it was almost like there were a bunch of guys that got together uh, and gone camping one afternoon that had never camped in their lives. I probably saw a half a dozen uh, dead Americans before I ever shot at North Vietnamese, whatever you call them, strictly from our own mistakes. Um, people walking along behind somebody with their trigger guard undone and tripping and shooting somebody in the back accidentally. You trusted yourself only. Uh, you weren't likely to trust many other people because you know, your life was on the line here. Who the fuck was that second platoon when we got oh. Oh, All right, I need a perimeter set up here, quick! Oh, man. You got any first aid dressing? I don't have one. They're up in there, I got your blood. M30 bath. Okay. I knew they were gonna get us to it. God damn. What for him? I got a perimeter set up around us. Get another company in here. You got a first aid dressing? Hey, get him. If I got in the belly, you better get me in the belly first. I'm a bit excited. Why not? Another day in the 
The third time I heard it, it somebody was saying, Tex, help me, Tex. And so my friend says, don't be a fool. You know, don't go out there. You're going to get killed. And I probably think that he was more scared of me leaving him there alone than, uh, than me getting hurt. But I didn't go out for like 10 minutes, and I kept hearing this, this, this friend of mine uh, holler and text, help me, help me. And uh, so finally, I don't know what happened. I didn't really think it over or anything. I just instinctively uh, jumped up out of this bomb crater and ran over uh, to help this guy. Just as I got to him, uh, I was putting one knee down on the ground, and... Uh, I was just reaching for him, and I felt this thud in my back. And I thought my other friend had run out too, and had tripped or something when I stopped, you know, and had like accidentally kneed me in the back. It was just, you know, like somebody punched you right in the back as hard as they could. Well, it knocked the breath out of me, and I took this deep breath. When I took the breath, this blood just came flying right out of my throat as if I had a faucet in my mouth, and, uh, you know, I ended up just falling, you know, like my chest hits the ground. I'm laying on my M16 and uh, I realized that I've been shot. I went back, I flashed back to uh, my training and uh, I, I remember yelling and screaming things like, they would yell, what's the spirit of the bayonet? And you would have to scream back to kill. That was the spirit of the bayonet. And I'm thinking, you know, my whole job is to kill. I'm a trained killer. That's all I know how to do. I'm an 11B40, light weapons infantry. I'm just a trained killer. And it's just, you know, all of a sudden I thought, I, how'd I get here? I, I never wanted to be a trained killer. I didn't want to kill anybody. I didn't know the first thing about it. I started thinking, you know, for the first time, what the hell is communism? I couldn't define it. And I'm laying here, I'm gonna die for killing a bunch of people because they happen to be communists. We began to realize that if somebody will actually live out here in this stupid jungle, dig tunnels all day long, live in these tunnels for 10 years just to fight us, you know, when we're there to do good, it made you start wondering, you know, if they're willing to go through all that, and I, I must admit, you know, that those things weighed on our minds. Maybe if it had been a different kind of war, we wouldn't start thinking like that, but the, the troops who were actually out there doing the killing really began to respect the people that they were killing. By late 1967, the American forces in South Vietnam numbered nearly half a million. US commanders were asking for more. Huh. Vice President Hubert Humphrey came to Saigon to reaffirm America's commitment. Huh. And may I say that despite public opinion polls, none of which, may I say, have ever been very friendly towards a nation's commitment in battle, despite criticism, despite understandable impatience, we mean to stick it out until aggression is turned back and until a just and honorable peace can be achieved, until the job is done. That is the policy of the President of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, and the Congress of the United States. So let me understand that. Republic of Vietnam for wounds received in connection with military operations against a hostile force. Congratulations. For heroism against North Vietnamese unit. I think after a while I began to feel that someone was taking advantage of our bravery and our courage, and I think there was that, to no good end. Uh, so we were being used, really, uh, for God knows what purpose, at least in terms that we could understand and appreciate in a gut level, which was the level on which you operated in, in Vietnam. Uh, words like peace with honor and negotiations, they didn't pay the bills over there, not when you were out in the field. Well, 
And the things I uh, try to put away is seeing my partners getting killed, laying out there in that, uh, in that mud and that rain for so long. That's the only thing that really upset me about that whole uh, operation. I could have given a damn about what happened inside that village. It's my personal feelings. In, in grade school, we learned about redcoats, the, the nasty British soldiers that tried to stifle our freedom and the tyranny of George III. And, um, and I think, again, subconsciously, but not very subconsciously, I, I began increasingly to have the feeling that I was a redcoat. Uh, and I think it was one of the most staggering realizations of my life uh, to, to suddenly understand that I, I wasn't a hero, I wasn't a good guy, I wasn't handing out candy and cigarettes to the kids in the French villages, uh, that somehow I had become everything I had learned to believe was evil. When I went on R&R &R in Hong Kong, I came very near to deserting. Somehow in the space of eight months, I'd reached the point from being a volunteer hurrying off to do his duty for his country to seriously contemplating desertion, just disappearing into the world somewhere. We had just gotten there, and uh, we was all sort of eager to, to do a good job and, uh, and uh, gain the respect as uh, being Marines. You know? And uh, we kind of looked after each other, because like I said, we came out of boot camp, and uh, we was on that, on that first team there, and we got real close, because the old guys that were rotating, uh, they had their time, and we was trying to... Uh, set a pattern for our own selves to uh, do good. And there, there just seemed to be no, no label on anyone except soldier and comrade and buddy. And based on that, they performed well, extremely well. And it was a pleasure to have, uh, and a privilege to have commanded them. For wounds received in connection with military operations against a hostile force. When did you get hit? 25 October. Sir. 25 October. Yes, sir. You were one of our early ones. Yes, sir. Congratulations. Exceptional meritorious service. Congratulations. You've done an outstanding job. That's uh, quite a mess. By direction of the President, on the provisions of Army Regulation 672-5. After almost three years, American combat forces had won major battles, but not the war. American commanders had expected their massive firepower to grind down the enemy. But despite enormous casualties, the communists were increasing their infiltration into South Vietnam as they prepared for the biggest offensive of the war. American experience is made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of the role of technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of the men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. At the Scotts Company, we help make gardens more beautiful, lawns greener, trees taller. If there's a better business to be in, please let us know. At Liberty Mutual Insurance, we do everything we can to help prevent accidents and make America a safer place. Liberty Mutual is proud to support American Experience. American Experience is also made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Major funding for this program was provided by the National Endowment for the Humanities. We are PBS.